why I am not a flat earther. I'm going to give you five reasons today. And uh, I realize a lot of my viewers are into the flat earth thing. And I want you to listen to what I'm saying today and consider the points that I'm making. Proverbs 18 verse 13 applies very much here. Don't answer the matter before you hear it. But it's an extremely important study that I'm going to be doing today. Um, going to be two different studies, two different videos. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures. And I'm going to show you that there's definite deception in the flat earth movement. Um, very high level deception. Um, please consider what I'm saying. If you love this ministry, if you esteem me very highly and love for my work's sake, uh, all the work that I've done over the years, then you owe it to yourself to listen to what I have to say. Um, I have been taken in by different movements over time where I believed certain things and whatever else, as many of you know, I was in Baptist preach or Baptist churches preaching from the pulpits. Could have been considered a Baptist preacher for a little while there. Um, even after I knew church buildings were wrong, I went back to it again. Um, I've done some stupid things and I've had to repent of that and say, Oh Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gotten into this or whatever. I was deceived. I was falling for things. Um, none of us are exempt from being deceived by the devil. So I want you to just go, if you're a hardcore flat earth or you believe it's the Bible way, whatever, watch the video. Okay. Go through the scriptures with me. Think about what I'm saying and then make up your mind and pray. Pray about it. Um, James chapter three. The first reason that I'm not a flat earther is it fails the test for wisdom that comes from God. Fails it very, very badly, actually. James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. All right. Now, doctrinally, yes, I understand James, the book of James, Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. I get it. But instruction in righteousness here. Absolutely, it applies to what we are supposed to do today, right? So let's just get that out of the way there. Don't try to dispensationalize it away. This does apply to us, okay? Instruction in righteousness, it absolutely applies to us. Um, we're not supposed to have strife and contention. And the fact of the matter is the flat earth movement is filled with strife and contention. Um, ironically, the thing that makes me not a flat earther, the strongest proof that I have that that makes me say I'm staying away from this flat earth thing is actually the flat earthers that I've had to deal with over the years. Um, I cannot tell you how many people have left this ministry, have called me a false prophet and all kinds of other things because I don't believe the earth is flat. That tells me it's not of God. Um, there's not one verse of scripture that says that we're to argue over the shape of the earth. And don't give me the thing, well, they all believed in the flat earth back then because that's everybody had enough sense. No. There were Greek philosophers back then that believed that the earth was a sphere, was a globe. So, yes, that wisdom was out there in terms of that understanding. People had it back then. Uh, whether you believe in flat earth, globe earth, whatever, it doesn't matter. It was there in the first century and nobody argued about it. Now it's become this huge contentious issue. There's fighting, there's backstabbing, there's all kinds of stuff. And I can preach about any subject. People come in with flat earth stuff. I can be talking about the catching up. Flat Earth. I can be talking about the Bible version issue. Flat Earth. I can be, it, and it's just people become obsessed with it. And I'm seeing this very dangerous thing. I was an atheist, and I learned about flat Earth, and then I got saved. Oh boy, that's dangerous. Okay, flat Earth doesn't bring you to Jesus Christ. Understanding that you're a sinner brings you in. You say, but yeah, but I had to confirm that the Bible is true. The just shall live by faith. Right? They get into some really dangerous grounds there. And I know a lot about false converts. I've run into thousands of false converts in my life, in person, and especially a lot online. And they'll do this thing. They, they will continue for a little while. They'll be there. And then all of a sudden they just, and they're going, they're right back to the world again. And, and away they go. All right. 
Um, if you are coming to God through science and whatever else, and I've proved this and I've proved that, uh, you come in a broken state. You're tired of who you are. You've tired, you're tired of your sin and living, and, and that's why you come to the Lord. It's because of your sin. And you hear that he died for your sin, that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And you say, he did that for me? Wow, God, could you please save me? Save such a wretch like me. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's good news. It's not scientific news. All right. But let's go through this, these passages here, or these verses. It says here, um, But if you have bitter envying, verse 14, and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Okay, the Bible, where does the Bible say that you're supposed to, a, a man that, that labors in the word and doctrine, esteem him very highly in love for his work's sake, unless he believes that the earth is a globe? Then you go against him and you, you just attack the guy and whatever else. I mean, I've had, I had somebody in the comments the one time and they said, um, what's more important? Can you really say that you're born again if you don't believe in the flat earth? Comparing the new birth, which is all through the scriptures, I've done multiple studies on it, comparing that to believing in the flat earth? Excuse me? I don't think so. Right? That's a problem. Verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. Isn't that interesting? Earthly. What is the shape of the earth? Sensual, devilish. Okay? It's earthly. It's something sensual. What is sensual? It's your senses. It's something that you can feel and touch and whatever else. Most people think sensual in terms of sexual lust and whatever else, but there's also the thing of this sensual. You have to feel things and whatever. People are getting sidetracked over the shape of the earth? Excuse me? Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> For where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. These arguments the flat earthers get into and just get all oh, this different stuff. And you, well, you believe in NASA and NASA's evil and whatever. Yeah, NASA is evil. And you believe this and you believe that. And I, well, what about the sun coming up and the sun going down? What about the things that the planets are in? And all the and all this stuff. It's evil. It is completely evil. And to be tearing down ministries because of the shape of the Earth. Yeah, they, I would say that's earthly, sensual, and devilish. And. Uh, had some people, some brethren, uh, brother and sister in the Lord, uh, send me this thing about David Hoffman, uh, this Baptist pastor, David Hoffman, which there's major issues with that guy. He's one that came out and he said, you can take the mark of the beast as long as you don't worship the beast in his image. I think that you might be okay with that. I did a video rebuking him on that. But he he's a flat earther. And he said that, you know, if you don't believe it, you're a globe tard. Huh? Here's the clip. That the globe tards do have a problem. Isn't that nice? Loving spirit there. Oh, you're a globe tard. You're mentally retarded if you believe in the globe. And his video was filled with so many errors and twisting of scripture and everything else. You know, I, I'll just be honest with you. I could tear this whole thing down and spend lots of time, but I don't want to because it's a satanic distraction. I'll tell you that right now. I'll tell you some other satanic distractions. You know a good one? Uh, the original autographs of the Bible. Only the original autographs were inspired. Well, we had to try to find what was closest to the original autographs. You can't. Nobody knows what they are. Nobody knows what they said. Nobody alive today has seen an original autograph. So why do the Bible scholars, you know, Bible scholars, why do they come out and try to get you to argue about it? because they know that you can't ever prove anything. It's the same thing with this flat earth, sphere earth type of debate going back and forth. Prove that the earth is flat. Sail to the edge, find a way out there, get a you know, whole bunch of Christians together and pray about it, get to the edge, find the ice wall and bring it back and show me. Show me where the end of the world is. Show it to me. And David Hoffman, it was embarrassing what the guy was saying. Oh, there was some guy that went up 15,000 feet and he had a hot air balloon and he flew up and there was, he was doing experiments and he went up 15,000 feet and he looked and he explained the earth is flat with a curved up edge. Uh, hello, I've been up to 30,000 feet in an airplane. I didn't see a flat earth, okay, with upturned edges and an ice wall over there or something. 
It's nonsense, this stuff that they're coming out with. And all through this whole debate of this flat earth thing, I'm seeing their evidence that they give. You can look and they, they say this and it, it can be based on false science. It can be based on whatever else. And it's just twisting it and tweaking it and whatever else. I, I'm, I'm seeing this thing. It reminds me very much of the Bible version issue. Well, there's shades and nuances of meaning in the Greek. And you can you can take the Greek word. Another way it could be translated is this. And, and if we just had the original autographs, then we could really settle this matter. No, you couldn't. Because the, it's not about coming to a conclusion. It's about just creating confusion. That's what the flat earth system is. And I've seen that. It gets people turning against a Bible-believing ministry, calling me lost and a heretic because I don't believe that way. That's nonsense. Oh, I don't agree with, you know, you don't agree with the flat earth thing? Then you're a globe tard. Excuse me? <laughs> Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I don't see that in the flat earth movement. I see a militant, fighting, angry spirit that comes from this flat earth stuff. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You see, it's the validity, validity of the Bible. Oh, we're going to see about that. I'm going to be showing you from Scripture that some of their big attacks and some of their big stands are completely without basis. I'll show you from Scripture. But uh, I won't believe in it. I'm not believing in it because it does not bear the marks of wisdom that's from above. It just doesn't. Okay, point number two. The famous Professor Orlando Ferguson map of the square and stationary earth drawing is filled with absolute nonsense. Okay, I'm going to put it up on screen here. I have it over on my computer monitor over here. There it is, the famous map of the square and stationary earth. And uh, the pride that's in this thing is just incredible. You know, 400 passages in the Bible that condemn the globe theory. Uh, none condemn the globe theory. Um, and I mean, think, just think about this for a minute. Condemn the globe theory. Uh, to condemn the globe theory, it would have to actually mention the globe theory and condemn it. The Bible doesn't just say, uh, God says, I condemn sin. Thou shalt not uh, sin. Okay, what is the sin? What's the particular sin? I don't need to tell you. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. If the Bible condemned the globe theory, then it would say it condemning the globe theory, not just taking verses and saying, I'm going to make this teach flat earth, which is exactly what these people do. Um, I'm just going to be very straight with you, brethren. Okay, if you're a flat earther, understand you have been deceived. And if you are going to stick to this thing, you're not welcome in this ministry. Very plain and simple because it is a satanic deception here that I'm seeing that's causing strife within the body of Christ. It's perfectly fine to have division. We divide from the lost world. But when it's causing strife in the body of Christ, it's not of God. And you had better repent of it and say, okay, yeah, this is bad. And I'm going to be showing you scriptures. We're not into the big part of it yet. So if you're shutting things down right now, well, that's a problem. But let's look at some other things here. 400 passages in the Bible that condemn the globe theory or the flying earth and none sustain it. That's not true. I'll show you quite to the contrary. This map is the Bible map of the world. Boy, no, no uh, pride there. This map is the Bible map of the world. Really? Okay there, professor. Um, why do you have four winged females? Why? And it says uh, four angels there. He calls them angels. You mean to tell me that this guy is going to tell me that this is the Bible map of the world. He knows it for sure. He's a professor. And yet he can't even read the Bible, simple English. That there's no angels that have wings? Huh. That's a bit of an issue. Uh, point number two. How does the equator work with his map there? Look at the map. There you have, I guess, the line down in there going around, you know, slightly below... Uh, going through the top of South America there, I guess, slightly below Central America, and then it spins up through Africa and goes around and above Australia and whatever. I guess that's supposed to be the equator. And But the problem is the sun that's on the little spinny rotatey thing there that's up near the ice wall, it's actually higher up from that low part there 
with the equator. Um, how does that work? And it's over spinning around near the ice wall or something like this. Then why would it be warmer at the equator than it is up north? Doesn't really make any sense. He's putting it way over towards the edge there. All right. Um, and I, here's another question that I have with this uh, map there. Okay, you have the center there. You can see where Alaska's at. Alaska's up top there of the, you know, up there and it's you know kind of near Russia and things and you have this this little center you know spinny thing like the top I guess and it goes over and it spins the Sun and the moon spin way out around like this um, then why does Alaska have almost 24 hours of Sun if you get to the really high north parts why is there a lot of sunlight there in Alaska and a lot a lot of darkness in the winter I've been there uh, have a brother that lives in Alaska and uh, went there many years ago and you know it's sunny for most of the day it's 11 o'clock at night it was still fairly sunny out you know the, they call it the land of the midnight sun how does that work if the sun is you know over here's the the thing in the middle and, and then over way over there towards the ice wall the sun's spinning around how do you get in here to Alaska and have it be more sunny there Huh. It's kind of a problem if you believe in the flat earth. You see? And this thing right here, again, just look at this. This guy puts it on here. He's supposed to be a Christian, I guess. But look at this. Okay, we have... Where are we at here? Okay, the green there is Alaska. Right there by my finger. That's Alaska and there's Russia. Close by each other and stuff. If the sunlight's out here spinning around like this, how are you getting almost 24 hours of sunlight there in Alaska. Huh. And again, there's so many arguments against this flat earth thing, you just have to think about this. All right. Uh, how do you get so many people that fly and in, in naval type of things and whatever, and none of them, you know, they've, they can all get towards the ice wall there, but nobody comes forward and shows the proof of it? I mean, the conspiracy is pretty big, I guess. I mean, come on here, brethren. You're falling for this, and it's messing you up. Again, I see this thing, it messes people up. I've warned about the, the anti-holiday thing for years, and I still get people, oh, you Dendinger's for Christmas. No, I'm not for Christmas. I'm for liberty. If you don't want to do Christmas, then don't do Christmas. If you want to do Christmas, and you can do it under the Lord or something, and have it as a time to remember and, and give gifts to each other and things, fine, do it, whatever. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, we're not supposed to fight about it. Don't fight about diet. Don't fight about holidays, the celebration of holidays. And don't fight about head coverings for women. Those are the three areas of liberty in the New Testament. Oh, what, you know, we have to fight about the, the shape of the earth or something. You're getting off, brethren. The devil's getting you. It's earthly, sensual, devilish. The devils are getting to you, turning you against good ministries. You're fighting about things that you shouldn't fight about. Just like the holiday issue. Everybody gets into the holiday, holiday issue. They go off the deep end. I didn't say people that don't celebrate holidays. That's fine. But when you start to make it into some kind of a thing, and oh, I don't know if somebody's saved if they celebrate holidays, you're, you've left the New Testament at that point in time. You're off in your own little world now. And if you're questioning people's salvation because they don't believe in the flat earth, you're also off in your own little world. All right? <clears throat> but now I'm going to give you a scripture which I've talked to flat earthers to their faces, and I ask them this, and they go, I don't know. Okay, you ready for a good one? Not one proof of a globe earth. Okay, I'll give you one. Matthew chapter 12. And I don't even care. Oh, brother, you have to look at every single argument. I don't have time to look at all the arguments. You know, I've left this flat earth thing go for so long, for so many years, I just hoped it would go away. It's not going away. It's getting worse again, tells me that it's not of God. It's just the contention's getting more, you know, just bigger and the strife and everything else. God's not behind that. He just isn't. I have no time to get into big, huge studies and answer every little single point because then they just come out with new points. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. 
But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Stop right there. Master, we would see a sign. I want to be able to see something here, and then I can believe you. Like the flat earth thing. I want to see, oh, the, if you measure out this far, there should be this with the curvature of the earth, and there isn't, so that proves that the earth is flat. Or it could prove that the calculations are wrong. Never think about that. But you see, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. I need to see what is the shape of the earth. I want to, oh, that, that verifies the Bible. Then I'll believe the Bible. No, you wicked, rotten sinner. You come to God as a sinner. <laughs> and, he, and he saves you, and then that's the proof that you need. Uh, I need proof of salvation. Okay, get saved, and then the life of sanctification that the Holy Spirit does in your life, that's your proof. <laughs> but the lost people won't accept it. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. The vast majority of them go to hell. They don't want to change their life. So you come and say, well, if we can just show the, the flat earth, if we could just prove it somehow, then you're going to get people to intellectually accept this book, and that won't get them saved. By faith. God's grace. Your faith. That's what gets you saved. And calling upon him, and then he saves you. Say it that way. But look at verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? Where's the heart of the earth if it's flat? Okay. Let's get this book here again. There's the earth. It's a flat disk. Like this. Where's the heart? Hmm? But you take a globe, and then what's in the center? Uh, molten lava, basically. Hmm. Like it would be hell down there? Yeah. The heart of the earth. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 31. You say, well, it's not where hell is. It's, you know, hell is some other magical place or something. Uh, no, hell is where Jesus Christ went. Uh, his soul went down there. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. <clears throat> he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. The soul of Jesus Christ, God the Father, went down into hell. Okay? And I've done plenty of studies on that, and there's a lot I could get into on that. I'm not going to in this uh, sermon here. His soul was in the heart of the earth, and that's where hell is. A burning place in the heart of the earth. Uh, does that line up with the globe earth? Uh, yes, I think it does. Oh, well, we'll just have to redesign the flat earth now, and we'll have to have some place... That's kind of maybe in the center of it or something like that. Uh, well, that'd be a problem because it'd be on the earth then and not in the earth. Well, yeah, but the flat earth is a few you know miles thick or something like that, so it could still be down there or whatever. How does that even work? Very weird. And again, you know, when's the last time you ever heard anybody saying that a flat disc has a heart to it? I've never heard of that. But another big one here, uh, the moon reflects, uh, the moon produces its own light. That's another one because you have the little thing there and, and the, you got the sun over here and the moon over here and they're just spinning around like this. And so what looks like, uh, you know, it's actually funny, one of the things that David Hoffman said in his video, he said about the sun rising and the sun setting. You know, out where I live, I mean, maybe if you live in the city, you can't see where the sun comes up and goes down. But where I live, I can see it come up over the horizon and go up this way and then down. All right, it's not going this way around me. All right, uh, sorry, that's nonsense. I have enough senses to look at that and say no. And David Hoffman, he said, it's a matter of perception. Uh, think about what he said in that video of his. If you haven't seen it, go ahead and watch it. If, you know, whatever. I don't agree with him. It's a matter of perception. 
Oh, you mean you have a preconceived notion and so you can look at something that contradicts what you believe, but you say, I perceive it to mean this. Yes, it goes like this and down and actually changes throughout the year. How does that work? If you live in a northern environment like I do, it doesn't go like this anymore. It goes more like that as you go through the winter. So my solar panels in the summer, they can get sun this way because it goes pretty much straight up over top of me. But in the winter time, it goes like this, down very low, barely even comes up. And I barely get any sunlight. How does that work if the earth is flat and the, and the sun just goes the same way, you know, all winter long or something? Huh? Okay. All right. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. And here's a, here's a good one. If you want a good blessing from this study, if you're mad, mad and everything at me right now, well, okay, fine. But uh, I'm going to give you a blessing here if you're a Bible believer. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 through 19. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. How do you get different seasons with the flat earth, with the sun and the moon going around in the globe? It doesn't make sense to me. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So you say, see, two lights right there. The moon produces its own light, right? Uh, no, Job chapter 25. This is another one of the big boo-boos that the flat earthers make. Uh, Job chapter 25, verse 5. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Now, if you believe that the moon produces its own light, and this verse here says the moon shineth not, um, then you have a contradiction in your King James Bible. See, I don't have a contradiction because I understand what the Bible teaches. The light comes from the sun, and the moon reflects the light of the sun. So it's a light that rules the night, but it's not getting its own light. It, doesn't, it shineth not. It does not have its own source of light. It's reflecting the light of the sun. And the Bible, all through the Bible, there's typology. God will do certain things. You know, the Song of Solomon is about a Jewish king and a Gentile bride. Why? Well, because God's for interracial marriage. No. What's going on there is God is saying, I'm showing what uh, this thing of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, I'll say it that way, will include Gentiles. And he'll be married to them as a Jewish king. Right? It's, you don't take doctrine from something that's typology. Right? But I'm going to show you here what's going on with this thing, the beautiful types here involved, where you have the sun being the producer of light and the moon reflects the light. Right? The sun is a picture of Jesus Christ and the moon is a picture of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. Let me show you proof of that. John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1 in the New Testament. This gets pretty interesting, some pretty deep stuff here. John chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 through 9. And I want you to notice the distinction between lowercase l light and capital L light. Lowercase l is a reference to the body of Christ, to saved sinners. Right? That's the moon, which reflects the light. We don't shine on our own. You're not looking at me and I have the Christ consciousness upon me because I've achieved some high level or something. No, the light that I have is what the Lord shows me. I can look at the scriptures and I can expound the scriptures to you because the Holy Spirit within me shows me these things. I shine the light of Jesus Christ. All right, look at the distinction. John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word, capital W, is a reference to Jesus Christ, the manifest Word. Lowercase w is always a reference to the written Word. Never forget that. It's very important. Verse 4. Now look at this. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Capital L or lowercase l? 
lowercase. Why? Because it's talking about the light of men. We shine the light of Jesus Christ. And the light shineth in darkness. See? We are shining in darkness. Who shines in the darkness? Who rules the night? Well, that's right. The moon. The church. You see it? The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The lost people out there. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, symbolized by the sun, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, John saying, I'm the one that's sent here, I'm not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. John is writing this here to bear witness of Jesus Christ. That was the true light, Jesus, which lighteth, lowercase l, every man that cometh into the world. Hmm. Very interesting there. So, you can clearly see the distinction. And it's given as, a, as two different types there. And I'm going to prove it to you through some more scriptures. Go back to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, which I already referenced. Song of Solomon, chapter 6 and verse 10. Okay, it says here, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon? Huh, she's as fair as the moon, the Gentile bride of the Jewish king. Interesting. But look what it says, clear as the sun. I say, well, we'll see, moon and sun right there. There's no, just the moon. No, how does it mean, how can you have the, the looks of clear? What does that mean? Clear as the sun, right there. That it says there in verse 10, and terrible is an army with banners. To finish up there, but clear as the sun, what it's ta what's it talking about? That is the light that we shine that comes from Jesus Christ. The sun of righteousness, the sun there, S-U-N, is a sim is symbolic of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not Jesus Christ. Don't get excited. Uh, we aren't, we're not Baal worshippers or something. We worship the sun or something. No. But it's just simply symbolic. And you get these stupid uh, pagans out there, these atheists, and they say, Christianity is just an ancient sun worship cult. Well, you're rather stupid. You can't understand typology versus actual doctrine. All right? Jesus is not the sun. Okay? But symbolically, he's saying there, I'm going to rule the day, and in the nighttime, you'll be ruling that. I won't be physically on the earth with you, but you don't worry about it because I'll shine my light through your life. Right? So, right there you have it. Um, reading the verse one more time. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon? Right there, she's compared to the moon. Clear as the sun, the light of Jesus Christ, and terrible as an army with banners. What are we in Revelation chapter 19? They come back as an army, I believe, with banners. Pretty interesting. Isaiah chapter 13. Good Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah 13 and verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So if you want some scripture saying his for the sun and her for the moon, right there you have it. Okay? Uh, and a very interesting study there. So, again, this is one of the very, you know, most important things with the whole flat earth thing, and that is, see, with sphere earth, with the globe earth, you have the sun here, and the moon over here, and the earth in between the two. All right. So when the earth is in a certain place, it creates the crescent moon look, because you see the shadow of the earth. And the shadow of the earth is bigger than the moon, so you don't get a perfect round crescent. You get more of an oval type of thing, because the earth, the shadow of the earth, earth is between the sun and the moon. Uh, you know, it's kind of a funny thing, another little analogy there with scripture. When the earth gets between the bride of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, kind of puts you in darkness. Hmm. What's an eclipse? Well, that's when the earth is completely between you and the Lord. That little eclipse in your spiritual connection there with the Lord. Uh, not saying you're lost, but I'm just saying fellowship is broken when you become very worldly. 
very beautiful picture there. But what do you do with that as a flat earther? Well, I, I don't believe that, you know, but the moon shineth not. It just means something else. Okay, then the Bible contradicts. You are literally making God's word into a lie if you're saying the moon produces its own light. The moon does not produce its own light. You contradict scripture. Job 25, verse 5. Uh, if you want to make that into something else, well, whatever. Reject the, the word of God. That's your problem. Um, just to be very blunt about that. And the fifth thing, and this is where I'm going to get into the big scriptures on this, um, the twisting of scriptures to prove a flat earth. Here's the book here. I opened this book up and I said, okay, what does he say about the scriptures? I'm going to read about that. Because I've gone through this stuff of, of this philosophical, well, if you measure this and if you look at that, and, you know, and it gets into all this stuff that you can't really prove. And so, you know, well, see, if you go out to the ocean and you have a telescope and you look and you should see the, if, it, if the earth is really curved, you'll see the boat go like this and disappear. But you actually see the earth and, or the boat and it's all this stuff that I have to try and approve and disprove and all that. I don't have time for that. What does the scripture say? And every single one of these flat earthers, that professor guy and whatever else with his wacky map thing, they all go to the same thing, right? And I've asked flat earthers, they say there's scriptures after scripture after scripture, hundreds of scriptures prove the flat earth. I say, give me one, please. They all go to the same thing. And that is 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30, okay, about the, the earth doesn't move and whatever else. And that's what the whole next study is going to be about. We're going to go through a lot of scriptures proving that, yes, the earth does move. All right. So right there you have it. Chapter 27, I guess, page 329. And right down here, he talks about 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 30. And he gives it as a proof right there that the earth is flat. Uh, when that verse, all it would really prove is that the it's geocentricity, which isn't even true. But that's all it proves. Okay, it doesn't prove that the earth is flat. But this the whole doctrinal thing of this flat earth, uh, the whole key scripture, so to speak, that they use, is this thing of uh, this, it, the earth doesn't move, if I can say it that way. I'm going to go into all the scriptures on the, the supposed flat earth or uh, stable earth thing, it doesn't move and all this other stuff. And I'm going to debunk that thing, and I'm going to show you from Scripture. If you're teaching that the earth doesn't move, again, you're contradicting Scripture. The Lord's not for this movement. I'm telling you right now. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. And if I have to you know, do another video or two, I might do a, another one or two. Just Especially the thing of David Hoffman's fourth video was unreal. The Scripture perversion that that guy was doing. Um uh, really horrible what the guy was doing, but just butchering the scriptures to try to prove his point. It was it was embarrassing. Some of his arguments that he was coming up with, just just flat out embarrassing. But I don't want to get caught up in this whole thing. I'm not afraid of it. I'm just afraid of wasting my time. All right, uh, Colossians chapter two verse eighteen through nineteen says here, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit, knit together increaseth with the increase of God um, I don't see that like I said with this whole flat earth thing are you really holding the head holding up Jesus Christ no you're talking about the shape of the earth you're earthly sensual devilish that's what's going on there. But you see, you get into those things which you have not seen. I remember Kent Hovind, uh, major issues with that guy. I don't believe he's saved, but he made a very good point at one you know, time, one of his videos, and he said um, that there's all kinds of philosophical arguments that atheists can get you into. And he said, I'll give you an example. Did you know that watermelons are actually blue inside until you puncture the skin? Prove me wrong. You know, people start to go, Oh, could I, yeah, if, maybe I could put a camera inside and have a wire. No, because that puncher of the skin. Well, if I could do maybe some kind of a, you know. No, it's a philosophical question. It's intended to get you off from what you're supposed to be doing. Heard a story the one time, uh, the Bill Eubanks book about 13 minutes over the Vatican here somewhere. 
And he was talking about how that they were out you know, passing out tracks the one time. And they each were given a stack of tracks to pass out. And he said, he looks over and this one guy is just over there arguing with some Jehovah's Witness. And he said, they get done passing out all their, tra their tracks. And he walks over and he says, you know, hey, what, what's going on? And he said, oh, I just had this conversation with this Jehovah's Witness. It was great and whatever. And, and uh, you know, really feel good about it. And he said, you failed. We're out here to pass out gospel tracks. That guy just sidetracked you. You're there arguing with this guy over Jehovah's Witness stuff and whatever. You aren't going to get anywhere with some of these heretics like that. All they want to do is distract you. And I believe that the flat earth thing is a distraction. I not believe. I know it's a distraction. And a lot of people are wasting time on it. And they're just, I'm not supporting Brian Denlinger anymore and whatever. Okay, then find somebody else to go to war for you. You know, that's the point of this ministry. That's the point of a preacher. I might do a study on this in the future. You find a man that can do things that you can't do. Right? You say, well, I'm working. I don't have time to put all this video to get these videos together and all the study and everything else. Uh, and I'm a little bit scared of what could happen to me. And what? Okay, then find a man of God that will stand against the Vatican, that will stand against evil. And then say, okay, I'm going to help pay that guy to have him go out there and fight these battles. That's the point. So, I'm um, going to be doing a much bigger study. Uh, I kind of, I was thinking, should I do the actual big scripture study first, or should I do this thing first? And I thought, well, I prayed about it, and it was just, Lord just said, okay, put it out there. And uh, quite frankly, it, it's going to sort out a lot of people. Um, and I, I'm sorry about that. It's, it's a, a great grief to me to see the body of Christ dividing over such a stupid issue as the shape of the earth. And it's a stupid issue. It's a very stupid issue. It's very similar to people fighting about the original autographs and a lot of other things out there. Um, it doesn't matter. It's not important. And I've tried to say that. I've tried to just kind of gently push people in that direction, but I'm still getting it. I'm still getting people coming out and saying, oh, you know, you, know, you need to believe in the flat earth and it, just fighting. And I, even though I've said, don't fight about it. Don't fight in my comments or I'll delete your comments. Oh, well, okay, I'll just let it go for a little bit. Then we'll get back to fighting again. It's not of God. It is not of God. So um, I'm going to destroy in the next sermon, we're going to go through the scriptures, and I'm going to prove that the earth moves. All right? Uh, from the scriptures. From the scriptures. Uh, so that is going to be it for this study. Um, I really do pray for you. If you are a flat earther, please understand that you have been deceived. You have been. You say, well, then you believe that the earth is a sphere and you understand everything about it? I believe it's a sphere because there's some, you know, things that prove that from Scripture. Um, I have no reason to doubt that. I don't really care. though. <laughs> I'm not going to fight about it. I don't bring it up with people. You know, uh, pardon me, sir, are you saved? Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, really? Well, praise the Lord. Uh, well, tell me about it. I want to talk to people about it. You know, everybody will, well, what about the, you know, certain prophecies? And what about this manuscript evidence? And what about this? And what about that? And where, you know, are you a Catholic? And, you know, what, are you a sinner? Okay? Talk to people about sin, not the shape of the earth. So that's going to be it for this study. And we will see you in the next study. That's where I'm going to get into the scriptures that destroy this whole uh, stationary earth movement. Okay? Um, please tune in. Please follow along in your King James Bible. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.